Come on, there must be somebody. Yes. I would like to ask you. You say that sometimes in life it happens that uh, someone calls you and say it's time for you to go to Asia. Are you ready for Asia? And so about these things, uh, or or the same thing happened to some Asian people yes. who come to the Western yes. world, which are the barriers uh, that can people usually have to um, see in front of them and have to go through them in order to upset, which are the obstacles, which... In order to, sorry? In order to upset, to upset the offer. You see, there are always some barriers, which are those barriers? I'm not sure I got the question. <laughs> the barriers it's to go east? In, yes, why some people refuse? Ah, refuse to problem? go, to go. I would say the, the kind of denial I was talking about is more for local candidates who are asked the post with a different company, so they don't move for. Um, I would say, today I notice a big appetite for, especially for Italians, there is a great interest and people would move. Let's say, probably I would give you the point of view of a headhunter, which is a very commercial point of view. Uh, so necessarily, I, I wouldn't suggest necessarily this is reality. Normally, we have clients that come to us with a clear idea. I need the best candidate in <coughs> four weeks. And you say, oh, I can give you in 12. Okay, let's compromise in nine. Okay. I need the best candidate in the shorter possible time for the right price, and I want to make sure that I'm not wasting my time. That's the approach. Um, from my point of view, I normally see clients that come to me with a very risk-adverse approach. So my clients typically would tell me, Mr. Melito, I need somebody coming from my, one of my competitors for the right price who must have an idea of what he's doing. He must be knowledgeable in my industry and I want him to know all my clients. This person is very unlikely to come from Papua New Guinea or from, from Alaska. This person probably if it is a, a regional equator in Hong Kong, probably it's coming from Hong Kong or Shanghai. So from the point of view of the headhunter, the people that I see, I would say the, commercial, the, the reason is a commercial reason. So there is a minim, minimization of risk when you hire somebody. There is always a risk like when you transplant an organ. There is always a possibility that the organ is not accepted. So whenever you hire a new manager in your organization, there is a risk that something will not work. That will be minimized. Uh, from the point of view of people moving from here, of course we need to distinguish whether you are a fresh grad and you are applying to go to Asia. And that's probably still, if you find a way, it's probably easier. Uh, whenever you become skilled enough, imagine you're somebody 35, 36 years old, you have 10 years experience with a company, you've been a commercial director in Europe, and you're taking care of uh, Northern Europe markets. Uh, Unless you possess great uh, transferable skills, so it's your personality, and unless you have a visionary, so your boss, your, the owner of your company is a visionary, say, you know what, he can do this anywhere in the world. But unless it, so unless it is an internal transfer, taking somebody from an external company to be moved to another region of the world, I see that to be a little bit. Uh, so, I'm sorry, Prabha, I can only give you my answer, which is a commercial <laughs> answer, which is minimization of, of the risk. Oh, I see the answer, good. <laughs> It is common. Now, bear in mind that, uh, as, as I said before, executive search tend to be something with a commercial approach. So in other words, you want to deal with people that your clients may buy by the way. Okay. Now, if your clientele is a primarily a Western clientele, so typically if you are dealing with Italian companies, uh, Italian, it, it, Imagine we are looking for a country manager in Japan, where probably also fluency in English is not that common. So in comparison, there are more people speaking, many more people speaking English in China than uh, in, in, in 
in the Egyptian territory. Uh, typically, those clients would focus on people that have an international demand. So they can relate closely to this person because he speaks good English. So probably the native-born Chinese or the guy that grew up in Canada and now is in, uh, um, in, uh, in Asia could be of interest of the clients of the international client of Chinese Now, I need to share one thing with you. Uh, the talking of placement in the whole of Asia, there could be an issue. And we see this issue particularly with Japanese and Korean client, uh, candidates. Reality is there is a way of talking. So, and especially if you think of countries like Japan, there is an etiquette. So there is a tone of the voice, there's a way of level you're bowing, you're going down. In that case, if you put your country manager who is Japanese, okay, Japanese by blood, who can, uh, the, the facial features are Japanese, but as a matter of fact, he was raised and trained in the US, the reality is that you see this person managing a team of Japanese, and there is a cultural clash because he is perceived as American. And it's too direct, the tone of the voice is too loud, okay? So they feel intimidated. And we have seen that what, in theory, on paper, for the skills is a perfect match because our client thinks it's a perfect match. As a matter of fact, when it comes to managing a team, that's a failure, that's a flop. So that's what we normally say, you know, but you hire skills because you like the TV, but you fire attitudes because if the attitude doesn't work. Did I answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So is there any process that we have follow or some aspects of the venture we have to respect when we do an application or, or when we introduce ourselves to the Asian market? I, I would say it really depends very much on, the, on your role. If you are the decision maker, uh, or let's say if you are sent there as or a CFO or a country manager, I would say I would try to understand in the office what are the beliefs, what is the tradition. So you can ask your predecessor, if this is an internal rule, what is the tradition of the office? You can ask your assistant. I think it's a fantastic thing that you're given an assistant with somebody that would be very helpful. Somebody that, and this is the person that would help you in the trans, in a cultural transition. I think it's very easy to say, you know, what is the tradition here? Uh, what do we normally do? Do we care? What is the seating arrangement? Who decides the seating arrangement? Are you sure that you can even take the initiative? If you have a, you have an office with 100 people and you have 90, 95 locals, I would say you talk to your assistant, take the initiative. Because you try, you know, you, you, you try to establish your territory. You want to be accepted. I think the key, if you move to Asia, is find a way to be loved by your staff. And it is not a matter that you use authority. You use, I think it must be a little bit like Kung Fu. Uh, you, you can fight Kung Fu or you can defend yourself by just having a passive energy in that. So you must be flexible enough even to initiate the topic. I, I would say I wouldn't be over concerned about that. But whenever you ask, and especially if you ask your assistant, they say, you know, Susie, what should we do? Bear, bear in mind that your assistant probably is going to tell the rest of the staff, you know, the new boss is getting about this. He wants to rearrange the office, he wants the office to have good energy, and we all are going to be happy here. So, I, I, my suggestion is don't be insensitive to that. Try to understand what is the tradition in your company. If there is no tradition, try to establish that, because <coughs> you will gain points. You're going to more score in the, uh, in the end. Did I answer you? Yeah, uh, I want to ask you. If I graduate from Bocconi tomorrow and I decide instead of joining Credit Suisse in London, I decide I want to challenge, I want to go to Asia, what are the most significant barriers in very practical terms? Let's say you join Credit Suisse and... Uh, no, no, no. It's instead of joining Credit Suisse in London, I decide to just apply for, I don't know, HSBC in Hong Kong. Okay. So I don't think there would be any barriers because if they are willing to take your board, and let's say for you at that point it's a matter of flipping the coin. They, that's the question. Like, are they willing to take you instead of like the thousands of local applicants 
for sure there is always space for uh, for foreigners. Uh, and of course there is uh, there are certain path for training. So I think in this sense uh, an element of great importance is normally to alumni network. Because as a matter of fact, whenever you graduate from a school or from an MBA, that is something that could take you uh, if you have a good uh, uh, alumni network into those positions. Um, I, I can give you, I tell you, I primarily specialize in fashion and luxury, so in, in the financial space I would not be probably the best person to give you uh, advice on what, um, uh, on what I see. But what I know is that for sure in Hong Kong we have a lot of young Swiss who are coming from the uh, University of St. Gallen uh, the, um, uh, and people that are in their 24, 25 and they are put through a training after a short time they spent at any point. So um, for Asia, I would say don't consider that as a place where tra trainees will only be uh, locals. So there is also an international. For you, for you, is a big change to go, for example, to start to work in Shanghai and go in a big city like New York City or working up like in the middle of China in a province? Oh, so that, that, that you will give different advice? Yes. That. Um, if you ask me today, I would probably go to Shanghai. But well, if you ask me what I would have done 20 years ago, I think in the China, if you're looking for a challenge, is the place. Uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, you're spoiled. You go out, you have a pizza, you have a friend, you've got a delicatessen, you've got a little mozzarella. You don't really feel it. Uh, if you are in, uh, I don't know, uh, I remember we had a client, we had a client in uh, Shandong province, and in Shandong province, they told me clearly that the, the, the factory was in a uh, little place, I don't remember the name. And as a matter of fact, they could not even find people coming from the biggest city in Shandong, which is China. They could not find even people from China because they didn't, want to, they didn't want to stay in a small place. Not even locals. So they were looking for an HR director. And they were paying tons of money. But as a matter of fact, um, nobody wants to be there. So, for somebody as a fresh grad, somebody that can go in that place, for sure you're going to learn traditions. You're going to learn on your skin. The second thing is you're going to learn real Chinese. Because, you know, if you are in Shanghai, so you go three hours to Chinese school, and then in the evening you are with your Italian friends, uh, tequilas and things like this. <laughs> you and that. You need to get to the point of thinking and dreaming in Chinese. And there is nothing better than a plan. Of course, maybe after, especially if you are in an industrial district with the dark skies and the high level of pollution, probably after six months, you escape from there. But you know, if you, if you say to a headhunter, you know, I've been there for one and a half years. I was in charge of this project. I mean, people will treat you with a lot of respect. So it's really up to you. If you, if you want a comfy life, go to Shanghai. Otherwise, in the provinces. And I think there are also plenty of opportunities in there because it is not easy to find people. Did it happen to you to have any offer in the sense? Yeah, I mean, I Take it. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Today, what I see today is that this tendency 
has a little bit changed. So still, you do not look at, at uh, like long careers, but I would say that the turnover is probably uh, shortened. On the other hand, we see an opposite problem arising in China. Uh, you see this with the workforce, for instance, in the factories, where somehow people come and go and there is no sense of loyalty, and people will typically change job for uh, just a different food allowance. Uh, you see that also with staff, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to retain them. So I think probably China today is what Hong Kong was 20 years ago in terms of uh, opportunities. And uh, of course, if you are transforming a society from a rural society into a, an industrialized society, you want to maximize your opportunities. So I would say in China, it, it, it's, a, it's a working process. Uh, in the rest of Asia, probably things are not going to be the same. It was a TV finger on it. <laughs> transactions and fund transfers, something that you really see. I would say, uh, can we compare China today with what Russia was 30 years ago? I mean, I have to say, I never found myself in a situation where I felt that that was a dictatorship. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can walk, circulate, do my business, uh, I'm respected. So I, I assume that when it comes to control from the, from, from the central government, of course, this is a, a country that is growing at a very fast pace. And you know, bear in mind that after Deng Xiaoping, they have been so good at keeping inflation at reasonable levels, unemployment rate at reasonable levels, crime rate at a reasonable level, at least from what we see. So I'm not saying that the best you can find in Asia in terms of freedom. But for you living there as a Westerner, doing your business there, probably if you try to use Google or if you try to uh, use a certain software, you see that the computer is a bit slower or certain sites will not open up. But bear in mind that we are dealing with a country which has grown at a pace and in volumes that have never before mankind has experienced. So I'm not saying I justify that, but just to reassure you if you work in China, uh, I, I would say it's a reasonable place where to make your living. Have you been in China before? How are the you? Sorry, if you can speak a little bit louder. In Italy, yeah, it seems to be kind of like a, a natural, like a national pastime or a, a hobby, or to kind of criticise politicians and, yes. and the government. Would you feel comfortable openly criticising 
like a government thing with colleagues in China or is it that kind of thing goes on? I would say, as an Italian who has been living overseas for, for many years, and of course I've been, I never lost contact with my country, so I read it every day in the newspaper, so I'm informed about what happens. Italians love to criticize everything. Uh, we live probably in the most, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Uh, we have everything. But you know, the problem is the Prime Minister, not the new government. I would say Chinese tend to be more detached from this. Uh, and it is not that they don't want to talk about politics, but I would say it is not the national pastime. Uh, this is on one side. Probably the other side is that the whole establishment is so big and so powerful and so very well organized that you already have succession plans in place and you know already probably who's going to be the next one. So I don't have the perception that the subject would be of interest as a pastime for discussion. So it never happens to me. Sometimes, I would say especially uh, candidates, uh, when I interact with candidates, but let's say Chinese friends who have been raised overseas, uh, they try to distance themselves uh, in order to show you that they are more westernized. And we say, oh, you know, this was Chairman Mao, we need to thank him. So they use things like this. But as a matter of fact, these are probably those westernized Asians that <laughs> if they interact with them, really, of course, they would have some difficulties. But as a matter of fact, the whole thing is more quiet. less uh, than the statutory uh, wages to, to work in the factory. This is changing. Uh, you have full freedom to fire people overnight. Just pay one or two months of salary. You send them home. This is changing, You're changing a lot. This, of course, is a, of course, it's a country that is growing. And a country that is growing is facing problems of bigger, uh, bigger. So in, in this sense, these, of course, would also limit the growth and the access to the capital. Uh, uh, but this is changing a lot in China. So, still, probably more than in terms of um, the um, protection of workers, where I see that it's still, but it's changing as well, is in terms of environment protection. As a matter of fact, until yesterday, uh, you could produce uh, any kind of items and not worry too much about pollution, chemicals, and things like this. But China, you know, now that they have the infrastructure, that they have the investment, now that they become big, now they want to do things by the book. And to do things by the book, you must follow rules. And that's where probably the moment you have the biggest uh, frictions with uh, the Americans, with the US government. But as a matter of fact, it is changing. So this is becoming a big power that is growing uh, to another stage. Sorry, I, have a, I know he has a Please. question. But as the known Asians are very talkative, and I don't hear many questions from the Asian group, I have a question for, the, uh, for you. Um, you have been here since two or three years, according to, to your uh, uh, year of uh, degree. And so you have been knowing uh, known Asians, uh, Italians or other uh, other countries, uh, student in this case, uh, what do you think might be knowing uh, other cultures, Italian and uh, non-Italian, but non-Asia, what do you think might be the greatest, because all the questions from the non-Asians were, what are the barriers? So you are here since a few years and you get to know the, the, the non-Asian cultures, uh, so I wonder if there is someone of the Asians that want to answer the question, what do you think might be the greatest barriers uh, of a known Asian coming young, fresh graduates, uh, not senior uh, uh, sales managers, uh, coming to work to China or Asia. So is there anyone of the 
Asians that want to, to tell the others uh, what might be the strongest barrier, according to your experience of the culture here and uh, any cues? Because this was the... Piece. I think it's really the problem of being conservative. And for typically Chinese, when they come to Europe or the US, first they may pass the language barrier. But the problem is they don't really want to, 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 to get along with local people very well because they feel I'm, I'm, I don't want to do like um, the, like kissing the chicks or shake my hands or I don't want to talk about my family or my marriage or stuff like this. They tend to form a group. This is really common and also for like Italian, French or probably. But for Chinese, this is very, very particular. They tend to move in within the group and they may not really feel comfortable about talking about um, something that may be different and others don't understand. And like, or the, the mind they form based in China and different from, from the mind you form here in Italy or in Europe. And that may be the barrier for them to get promoted or to make the real friends in Europe. Yeah, that's it. I think that's, if I may have more of it, uh, based on my experience, I think this is an excellent explanation. And, uh, you know, when we were talking about the case of somebody turning down the offer, uh, unless, you know, we prompt or I have my Chinese clients uh, come to ask why they're turning the offer, they could probably not share with me the reasons because they think it's something that is part of the culture and probably I not understand the French way of Okay. Uh, so probably there is this tendency of remaining uh, a kind of... Uh, Believing ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there was that before. No, before. What's that to do in China about religions, about other non-Christians? Oh, this, uh, this basically came with Chairman Mao. Chairman Mao, the Cultural Revolution, did two things. The first one was... Uh, this is, Similar, similar things with the lung. Uh, religion in China has become a hot issue. So you still have freedom to be Christian, to be whatever you want. But fanatism is forbidden. So I would say even if you see the uh, Catholic Church in China that dominates the bishops, and then of course they are not endorsed by the Vatican, that's one of the issues. So, I would say, you have phenomenon in China like uh, Falun Gong, for instance, which is this kind of uh, uh, sect that you know, they, uh, they tend to fight the government, uh, they, they, they tend to be, appear like victims of the government. I would say, the approach, at least from the way I see it, of the central government in China towards religion is, do your things, but please, uh, just don't give me troubles because we can have enough troubles. You know, bear in mind that in China, in China you would have on the uh, uh, north and east parts going towards the Central Asia, you have Muslims, and in the past uh, that there have been frictions in there. And then, of course, as a tradition, you have Buddhism, and then, of course, we have all these different beliefs. Uh, bear in mind that a similar approach was taken in Singapore. Uh, by Lee Kuan Yew. And in Singapore, you had the Malaysians and Indonesians, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Buddhists, uh, sorry, uh, Muslims, uh, then you had uh, Buddhists, and then you had the Indian presence with the Hindus. And reality is that even if everybody's talking about God and uh, infinite love, reality is when you put religions together, they start fighting. So I think China has taken an approach which is not different from the probably more aligned in Singapore. And yes, you're free to practice your religion. Uh, if you want to go to, to church on Sunday, you can do that. Uh, of course, you don't start a, a protest on the street in Jesus Christ, because it doesn't work. Yeah, I, I wanted to add something about uh, what my colleagues said. So by my personal experience, I spent one year in China studying. And what about? Where were you? Uh, I was in Harbin. Harbin. And uh, I was also one month and a half in Shanghai. I think when 
one year, more than one year. So um, I think the problem of as a foreigner is not that we are not willing to like, make friends with Chinese. The problem is that even if we try, sometimes it's from our approach. Because, for example, we always say things directly. We are, we think, we, we impose our preferences on the others, let's say. I think that Chinese people do not do it. I make a, a stupid example, for example, if uh, we go to the cinema, all right, and I was with Chinese friends, and like, they ask, uh, what would you like to see? And I immediately say, what I would have liked to see. And so everybody was like, oh, okay, okay, let's go to see that, you know, because, and, but usually, and that was wrong, but I didn't understand it, like, the first month, the second month either. Then I started to realize that maybe there was something wrong. And because they, they do not do that, they just simply say, ah, that is good, but maybe we could also go to see the other one. <laughs> and, uh, what do you think? Do you like more that one or the other one? So, and, and it's like this with everything. And like you go to the restaurant, even the, the food you want to order. Even if you know that you want to order that food, you, you don't have to do it because you don't have to impose your preferences on the other person. And I think this is really difficult even in relationship with other people because you have, at the end, to to make friends, you have to be kind of lucky because you have to guess what the other person likes, you know? Because at the end, even, even when, you, when you go to, to see to watch a movie, you have to guess what the other person likes and the other person has to guess what you like. So at the end, it could, it could happen that both of you go to, to watch a movie that none of you like, <laughs> thinking that the other person is happy, so you're happy, but it's, but it's not like that. So, you can try to act a perfect, I can perfectly relate to that. But if I were you, I would try to take the initiative by saying, you know what, I want you to bring me to a movie that you think is great. So you choose this time. Last time I chose, I choose this time. Uh, I have to say, whenever you deal with Asians and Chinese, I'm fantastic on this. There is a great sense of respect, a great sense of hospitality. Uh, it could be also a little bit a shy, a shy approach, if you want. Uh, there are different parameters in the communication. Uh, we tend to communicate in a different way. And of course the fact that you use English as a medium. Uh, of course here we are talking about international students that are used to that. But you know, if, you're, if in your office you have somebody who has never gone overseas, and probably the English they learn is in school or by some movies, they know that there is a sense of uh, being inadequate and probably they know that part of the communication will be lost, they don't want to disappoint you. So, I would say there is, first of all, a barrier which is the language. And let me share with you that you were, uh, I don't know if you use Mandarin as the medium or okay, uh, but I find myself, for instance, my business partner is British. And whenever we interview somebody to come and join us, uh, I speak English with my Italian tempo and my Italian accent, which could be on one side exotic, it could be also funny sometimes. My British part <laughs> speaks with you know, mine, uh, it speaks with a typical accent from London. And you know, he's the one that normally is he's the landlord. Because he's asking questions with some English humor sometimes, and you often sometimes people look at him like <laughs> so on this problem we have the advantage of not being intimidated. But it is true. Uh, I think it's up to you. Uh, it's good that you learn that on your scheme after three or four months. So uh, probably somebody had told you day one, you know what, you are facing this, try to be democratic and try to convince them to, to take the initiative. Uh, but let me tell you that I, I told you this at the beginning of the, of the session. Uh, it's a great privilege to work with Asians because you're given a lot of respect and a lot of credit. You're given choices. Now, uh, one thing that I notice is whenever I come back to Europe and I land in Rome and I go and get my first cappuccino after so six months, I'm going So normally, I, I, I go to the bar and normally I try to use a smile because I'm used to smile to people. So I'm 
so I tend to be reassured. And I find somebody, you know, I normally use lei, mi può dare, okay. And somebody is addressing me with two and doesn't even smile at me and doesn't care about me. And I find the same thing when I you find very polite Chinese or Japanese interacting with uh, people in the shops and the bars, there is a different, a different attitude. So I, I personally find that in our approach, besides being probably intimidating, we may sound in the group. So I think after a while, we tend to develop this more softer style, which is, what do you think? Can you bring me there? Can you choose food for me because you are the knowledgeable person? Of course, the day you go to a, an Italian restaurant, you can reciprocate that and offer to guide the choice. But uh, I think you did a fantastic analysis. And it took three or four months, but eventually you brought something with you. I think there was a question there. Yeah. Going back to the business perspective, I would ask you, okay, what are the differences in the between Taiwan Why a company should be based on Taipei yes. instead of Hong Kong or, you know, uh, typically, typically, Taiwan has developed a district of excellence for technology. Uh, so if you think of uh, microchips, uh, electronics, that, that, that's Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan has been also, for a certain time, a district for the production of shoes. So sports shoes, one of the districts you find is um, in terms of uh, uh, Hong Kong, you know, Hong Kong for sure, real estate, which is uh, uh, yeah, real estate, which is uh, one of the most important industries. Uh, you will find financial services. That's a very important part for them. So typically, if you're looking for um, to establish your company financial services, you go there. Even if this is changing with uh, private banking because of the local legislation, uh, Singapore is more liberal and still the bank secret is more enforceable. So private banking is moving to that bank in Singapore. So uh, Hong Kong, as I told you, hotel industry, uh, real estate, financial services, Taiwan is technology, China is, especially southern China, is whatever is heavy industry, uh, injection moldings, factories, uh, also discreet producing fashion items. Um, I would say if you go slightly north, you have the district of automotive uh, and you have a concentration of uh, joint ventures for uh, uh, Volkswagen, uh, Fiat, uh, you name it, uh, all the, the, the general models and so on. Uh, Singapore and uh, Thailand tend to take part of automotive, but from another point of view, which is primarily motorcycles. So you have that companies like Triumph, or Ducati, has just opened a, 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 a company in Thailand, they produce there. Especially spare parts, tires, they're all done there. Uh, if we talk of, uh, there are of course markets that somehow are taking the lead are markets like Indonesia. You know, Indonesia has gone through ups and downs uh, with moments of great expansions. Then, of course, you have a kind of a coup, and uh, for some reason, uh, foreigners are kicked out. They have lost their investments, but that is a great interest in Indonesia because it's a big <coughs> region with a big population, of course, uh, uh, with a lot of wolf power production and also spending power. So that is, if you want a map, uh, if you look at Japan, we are more familiar with the kind of production they have. Oh, sorry, Singapore is a very important hub for life science, pharmaceutical life science. So what you see today is that life science and the, research, the research in life science is primarily done in Singapore, in the, in the Academy of Singapore, but production is done China. And of course, there is a, a big appetite for the pharma world because China is growing a lot, and also the business of um, hospitals and private healthcare is becoming uh, more and more important, and that's why there is a, a big interest to look at China. What's the role of India? India is, a, is an important market. Of course, uh, India has been a great place 
follow the training of engineers that are a lot of growth, and there is a, a great interest in the market. India, from the point of view of the organization, has grown in a completely different way compared to China. To give an idea, and of course, I relate to the world of fashion and luxury because it's the one I know. Um, if you build a shopping mall in China, the shopping mall is part of a city that uh, has been planned in any aspect, including the railways, including the motorways, and including all the infrastructure surrounding it. So you know that if there is a shopping mall <coughs> in this place, for sure the shopping mall is also matched with uh, car parks, uh, trains, um, uh, the, the, the underground train and all this. India has done it. Bear in mind, India has big issues with taxations. Um, for instance, in the field of luxury goods, uh, Indians typically do not buy luxury goods in India because taxation is high, and whenever you buy something, they need to register with your credit card. So, since there is a chase towards even revenues, if you're buying a Patek Philippe watch, uh, it is implied that you have a certain type of revenue. So basically, there is a flag on you. So typically, Indians who travel overseas will buy these overseas. So talking about the development, in India, the development of cities and not be so systemic and organized as it has been in China. Uh, so I would say, everybody say India is the new China. You have to look at that. My personal point of view, with no disrespect to anybody, is that we are far from that because the Urban, uh, urban planning is not at the level of China. China, from this point of view, has been impactful. has been absolutely right. Can I answer your question? As you stated, you specialize in fashion and luxury, right? So I would, I would ask your perspective or uh, based on your observations of retailing of luxury and fashion business in China or in say Hong Kong or Singapore, what is changing now? Because like um, the market now, uh, more local local Chinese will prefer to go to Europe to buy luxury goods for their own use. Yes. And they tend to do less gifts for the government officials, which used to be a big consumption of the luxury goods. Yes. So based on your observation and your knowledge from your clients or something. I would say what, what you're mentioning is correct. You know, uh, uh, the world of uh, the, the market for luxury goods, especially in Hong Kong, uh, in, in the recent months, in view of the uh, uh, change at the, at the helm of the, the, the government, has slowed down because, of course, people are not buying any more gifts for the uh, government officials. Um, I would say China, you know, we tend to talk with clients, and our clients have a certain concern when it comes to the uh, market for luxury goods in China because that has been a slowdown. Bear in mind China, uh, we're talking about growth last year on the 7.5%, which is a great number if we talk of European economies, but for the kind of infrastructure that China has, it's a, a considerable slowdown. Now, you see a big presence of luxury boutiques all over China. Uh, you find the inner city uh, in, the, in the remote inner Mongolia, and probably you will find a big, gigantic, waiting tone boutique all shining inside. And you may ask yourself, but why is a uh, VMH group spending this money here? I'm using a VMH just to, uh, well, this is the same for Gucci, for Prada, for Israel. Reality is that the luxury world is, in a certain way, trying to drive the development. So in other words, if you are a developer, you're trying to build a small city, or let's say a big conglomerate, I think if you want to attract people that want to buy real estate, you're going to contact MS, or you're going to contact Gucci and say, you know what, we can give you the place for free, and we even build the shop for you. You only need to hire three or four people, or ten people, and just have them there to do the business. So on one side, there is a big presence. Reality is that the market for luxury goods has had a certain slowdown. But don't be fooled by slowdown. Still, we are talking of big numbers. You know, we conducted a survey last year. And we talked to fashion brands, and all of them were expecting year on year 30, 40 percent increase. There was one who told me, you know what, if you're planning to grow in the next five years, less than 25 percent a year, for sure, you plan 
in this walk. Because you have shops that, as a matter of fact, put a lot of things inside and they can sell. Now, you have very hot hubs. Southern China, I would say, Hong Kong is the place. Macau is the other place because you have people getting uh, earning money or winning money at the casino. They immediately invest in a, in a shop and watch for the wife. Um, Their wives. That's uh, <laughs> what the true is that Hong Kong and Macau are tax free. Whereas if you spend 50,000 euro in a watch, probably half of that goes into taxes. So my point of view is it cannot, cannot continue like this. You cannot think of growing at this kind of volume, but keeping this momentum with this level of magnitude. It doesn't work like this. But for the time being, I'm going to be scared. So there is, there is at the moment of great interest for Chinese people, and we see that in Hong Kong. You know, you can see that they have a uh, Brioni suit, a nice golden watch. There is cash, there is liquidity. Chinese uh, traditionally never rely on banks to put money in the bank. So there is money, there are R&B that are accepted in Hong Kong that you can use to buy luxury because it's a way of rewarding yourself. You want to be part of the club. Because now, you know, you've been working like a slave for, for many years, uh, you've been really now you deserve it. Um, the other thing with the same approach, and that's why the price of real estate in Hong Kong has gone crazy, Chinese come with bags of money and they buy apartments in cash. And that's why, for normal men on the street, buying real estate in Hong Kong has become impossible. Because there was a scheme until a few months ago that for male and Chinese, if you buy an apartment, you, are, you have the right of, uh, of uh, uh, reside in, in Hong Kong. And so we had a great access of uh, Chinese coming with the banks of money. And for anybody who lives on his own salary, it has become impossible. The price of properties have gone year to year 30, 40% of this. And that was already one of the most expensive markets in the world 15 years ago. Imagine today how it is. still to continue developing in China, yeah. in China. I would say there is a, I would say fashion and luxury is for sure, together with automotive. Uh, uh, Ferrari had a study here last year, and especially for sales in China. Uh, the, the, the challenge in China today is not convincing people to give you four million and me to buy the latest Ferrari. The problem is convincing them that they need to wait for one and uh, uh, people of Ferrari were sharing with me that they had potent angry potential customers getting to the shop with the same suitcase that we used to buy apartments in Hong Kong with they were saying, I want it, I want it now, it's in the showroom, I pay you double the price, I want it. Uh, so there is a great appetite for, for luxury uh, from this point of view. I think automotive is one of those. Uh, if allow, you allow me, off the record, because of course this is off the record, and I want to share this with Italians and Italians. I think that Chinese today have a great interest for what Made in Italy stands for. Wake up, they wake up in the morning and they want to drive a Ferrari, they want to have a pair of, of Ferragamo waffles, they uh, want to have a Brioni suit, and they dream of this, or they want to have a, a briefcase for Prada. They dream about this because it's because of the artisan world and the artisan region. I have to say, Italians, we are guilty for one thing, because we are closing down factories. We are, in order to increase margins, we are transferring production overseas. There is nothing wrong with the workmanship of Chinese. Chinese can work very well. But the reality is, if I compare, this is off the record, <laughs> but if you consider a brand like Hermès, Hermès is homemade, 100% uh, made in France, and even the zipper puller are, are made in-house, they do not produce these things outside. You have other brands, I would have 
public placement, uh, recent public placement, that produce in China, that produce shoes in China, uh, they produce uh, uh, bags in China, and they leave just the inner part in the same box, so they transfer to Italy, they glue it, they touch it, I'll tell you for sure because we have a factory, and uh, they sell it and they it. There is nothing against the quality that Chinese can produce, but made in Italy has to be preserved because people dream about that. So I'm not talking about the skills, but a piece of made in Italy, a piece of color, a piece of leather, a piece of uh, sartorial elegance, it's a pity if we destroy this. And you know, whenever I, I, I speak with entrepreneurs who are telling me, you know what, we want to uh, localize the production, we want to close Italy, I think there is a, a social responsibility of the entrepreneur. You cannot send people on the street because instead of, a, you know, if you look at certain fashion items, the margins are incredible. So that margin could be 100 or could be 500. If in the neighborhood of 500, we destroy the dream because Chinese the dream of <laughs> Anybody else? What suggestion would you give to a newly graduate who, uh, thinking about going to China and maybe working in the luxury industry? It's a nice question. Uh, bear in mind that there is a, a great interest for quality support in luxury. What you see today, and that's the big dilemma that uh, many of our clients are facing, is Hong Kong is mature. You have fantastic retail managers, you have fantastic uh, uh, salespeople, you have good buyers. So the natural step is under the responsibility of these very well trained people in Hong Kong, so you put under the responsibility also China. But the reality is the next step is everybody's going to China and everybody is hand picking candidates. So as a matter of fact, I take somebody from Gucci or from Louis Vuitton, I keep him six or eight months, somebody else is going to double the salary and uh, uh, I'm going to lose the person. So today, today there is a great interest in having quality people. Bear in mind that the world of luxury so far in Asia is uh, suburb. The, the importance of that kind of, uh, I mean, the, the, the decision makers for fashion and luxury are still in New York, Paris, and Milan. So if you had a chance, to start, or if you want to start a career in luxury, especially, especially for Asian candidates, because you have language skills that you can use, Mandarin, for instance, I think there should be all the interest for the big fashion houses, the big maisons, in hiring somebody to train here where the quintessential training can come from, and after a certain time spent at headquarter level to be seconded in China. There is a great need, and the question is, my secret is try to identify this need and try to talk to the right people. Could be HR, could be people in charge of product development, could be people in charge of uh, management. So I, my suggestion is start here and try to be better. You know, also because companies like uh, uh, they have training programs which are very good. That's why, for instance, normally. Uh, People from LVMH are normally stolen afterwards and they go anywhere else in the world. So I think they're going to make the next one. I have a question for, I think it's probably better for Professor Sylvia. Because um, you said made in Italy, that's really um, a dream or something. I think that's really the phenomenon of how Italians can commercialize the brand and how they operate the brand management. And I'm really shame that we don't really have a Chinese brand that is known worldwide. You're going to have it soon. Uh, so this is changing and I think there are great yeah. designers. Yeah, and uh, I want to say it takes time for a brand to grow and be known worldwide. So there's a shortcut, say merger or acquisition. But I really want to know what is the problem or barrier here <laughs> that the Chinese entrepreneurs cannot really find the target uh, from Europe or say uh, America that they can acquire to to boom their 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 brand brand impression. Or, uh, That's a very tough question, <laughs> considering they are um, <clears throat> to answer. Entrepreneurship 
in Italy you stop even for Italian, so you know that it's not so easy to develop uh, new companies for several rules, bureaucracies. Second answer, so this is one issue about uh, uh, entrepreneurship in this country, and uh, you know that probably uh, there is a big issue around the country in general, and we are talking a lot about this. Uh, the second thing I think it's people thinking about the dreaming of the made in Italy. Uh, it's really, in general, it's really, really difficult, even for good products, to change the idea that is in the mind of people uh, about what is fashion and the made in Italy. I'll give you an example, and I'm Italian by birth, so are there any French in the room? Okay. So, if you speak to Italian producer of cheese or wine, Italians feel that, you know, it's very unfair that the French products, the wine or the fromage, are so widespread all over the world. But it's very deep, of course, the biggest wines are in France, that it, there is no issue. But if you think to Italy, there are wines. If you think to people from Piemonte, Piemonte is a region in the northwest of Italy. And if you name the word formaggio or fromage or cheese, which is the same, they get mad because they say, we have a lot more cheese than the French. But in our mind, the French cheese, the French wine, and the way that the French people were able to market their products were historically longer than Italian, so I'm not talking about fashion, I was making a... So, even if, suppose, we can have uh, not the biggest red French wine, but very good wines, very good cheese, uh, you know, it takes a lot of time to become as famous as they might, have, might be all over the world with respect to that product. So, going back to the fashion, it takes really a long time to, <coughs> luckily enough for Italians, luckily enough for Italians, it takes a long time to change uh, the image of uh, Italian fashion. If you think, you know, French and Italian are competing also on fashion. Some people are saying that, uh, you know, so it's, but it takes time. Even if, uh, for example, I was thinking to a company, Luxottica. You all know Luxottica from the glasses, Ray-Ban which might be more famous for American Italian. I don't know if Chinese like uh, Raven. So Luxottica is an Italian company. It's an entrepreneurial company. The entrepreneur is named Del Vecchio and is very studied for leadership. Luxottica is uh, one of the biggest uh, multinational company now in the world. It's probably is the leader in the, um, for glasses, for sunglasses. Uh, and I think that um, Luxottica was uh, really a great company because it kept the roots in Italy. So because of the vecchio, because of the entrepreneur, probably never want to close the um, plants in Italy. Luxottica developed in the Northeast. So was able enough to make advantage of the networks and the people working in that valleys. In that valleys, it's not so easy that if you are you actually look Luxottica, you go in another company because there are mountains between. But Luxottica was, a, was and is a great international company. It now has plants in China. He has plants in India. He kept the plants in Italy. He, Luxottica bought uh, Ray-Ban, uh, I mean, many, 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 many brands. Uh, but I think, for example, speak, speaking with people in, uh, in Luxottica, which is a company you know quite well, uh, uh, when they, it's not true that only Italians can make good classics, okay? or only because of the, um, the innovation they do in production. Where do you think they do innovation in production? Research. In, in China. In the China place. I know a supplier for ribbon in my area. Okay. Here, so they do innovation, of course. Uh, the difference is uh, in cost. Uh, in labor costs are tremendous. So if you only look at, and also it's not true anymore that all Italians can preserve the good quality. The good quality is in the Chinese brand, they do innovation. But this company is great probably because it 
managed to be international, having the roots in Italy, developing in other countries, doing mergers and acquisition uh, in many countries, and probably one of the key assets of uh, this country is uh, to get to know the different cultures and to work very well in very different cultures. So I think this example is very interesting because uh, when I think to my country, I always think about uh, problem issues and fear and uh, but this is a very good example of being multinational, being multicultural, keeping uh, the local roots, uh, and Luxottica managed to keep in the local roots, uh, but Luxottica now is a company in the world. For Chinese people, it will be very, very difficult probably to have a, a product which in the imaginary of people will be as the fashion man in Italy, but I think the world will be different in a few years. <laughs> in a few years. And uh, even in terms of your aspiration, I'm a bit older than you. I'm 46. 46. I did my exchange uh, with Bocconi in 1988, so a few years ago. <laughs> and I remember at my time, uh, all the people that wanted to do the exchange uh, wanted to go west. So for us, uh, was New York, Boston, no other place. And there were already relations with, uh, if I look now, I teach, I teach uh, undergraduates, Master of Science, uh, and if I ask to my students, I always ask to my students, uh, are you thinking to an exchange program? Because this is one of the value of Bocconi. And when I do a little uh, survey, where do you want to go? Now, they, they, the Italians, and the non-Italians, but non Asian, they all want to go Northwest. Uh, Yes, New York is still New York, but apart from uh, big cities. Uh, so the, the, the world is changing. Even the aspiration, even cultures are changing. So I don't think the world in which a Chinese pro product uh, will become uh, very important in, uh, in our uh, mind uh, is too far away. Still, we had very good fromage and good wine. <laughs> but, but the French has a longer history. It's a better marketing capacity and very good products. And uh, what is hard to change is the idea. If you go to London, enter to an enoteca and uh, one shop in London, uh, and look to the brands. They are all French. So it takes time because uh, in, <coughs> in the mind of probably non Italians, the wine is French, fromage is French, and uh, fashion is probably probably still Italian, so it takes time. Yes? The last one. The last, the last, the last one. one. <laughs> 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 to shoot them. Which are the many professionals in China I would say what uh, we see at the moment, very much, if you deal with exact research, probably you're talking about the top part of market, so project manager managers and the CFOs and the commercial directors. But I think the greatest demand, as I was uh, mentioned before, there is a lot of interest for qualified people. Uh, again, you have boutiques, uh, you have clients, probably means that since you have a shortage of personnel, you must make sure that your people in the shop are trained to the point that uh, you're not trying to sell a, a thousand year handbag and you have one of the shop people have a large amount of on the counter with a small rock. So that's because when, when there is a shortage of people, you tend to take any value. That's a, so uh, you need to have good training, and I would say if today we're talking about retail directors, it is a huge demand. Something which we do not see because it is not a level of search is shop people. So I would say shop managers. Uh, don't think that shop managers is a, a cheap position or is a small position. Uh, normally, if you take a, a typical luxury brand and you consider a shop on Kendall Road in Kong, that's something that would have probably 180 people in a shop in different shifts and a total of about 100,000 euros a year. So it's a small company, but as a matter of fact, these people are earning a fraction of Manager. Now, in China, there is a great amount of these people. They are impossible to find. That's why now the new trend is 
after stealing from others and that there is no more resources available. He is training these people, taking them from hotel industry, taking them from uh, people coming from MBAs like SF in Paris for luxury, and, uh, and he put them through a because you know the mindset is there, there is an interest for luxury, it's a matter of transferring skills which are just skills of natural. Okay, very good. So I think that was the last question and we're approaching ending time. So I would like to thank again our guest and thank you also very much for coming and see you next time.